The American dream in decline is a phrase we often hear these days. What can we do to turn the tide of what has become a nightmare for many Americans? Welcome to Off the Shelf, the book review podcast program from the Conference Board, your source of critical information for business leaders and other listeners on key topics in business and society. My name is Bart van Arik. I'm Chief Economist at the Conference Board and Head of the Economy, Strategy and Finance Center. Today, I have the pleasure of hosting a conversation with Angus Deaton. Angus is the currently the Senior Scholar and right, the Eisenhower Professor of Economics and International Affairs Emeritus at Woodrow Wilson School of Public and International Affairs and at the Economic Department uh, at Princeton University. His research areas are in poverty, inequality, health, well-being, and economic development. And in 2015, he was awarded the Nobel Memorial Prize in Economic Sciences for his analysis on consumption, poverty, and welfare. Today's conversation with Angus is about his latest book, which he co-authored with N. Case, also an economist at Princeton, titled The Death of Despair and the Future of Capitalism. Welcome, Angus, and thank you for joining us. Thank you very much for having me. Angus, this book is about the decline in life expectancy in the United States in recent years, something that we actually haven't seen since 1980 or in any other wealthy nation in modern times, and an event that really is concentrated among white non-Hispanic Americans aged 45 to 54. And you call these deaths of despair as this trend arises from increases in suicide, drug overdose, and alcoholism, which have risen dramatically and which now claim more than 150,000 American lives every year. It's a tough subject, it's very discomforting, but because it is so well documented and it's very well written, it makes such a compelling case that I would recommend anyone who thinks this is a problem that we need to tackle to read this book. Now, Angus, before we go in more detail, we're recording this in the middle of a global pandemic, the novel coronavirus COVID-19, which of a size which, interestingly, we also haven't seen since 1918. And we'll discuss the insights from your book on today's situation later on. But to put things a little bit in context, I'd like to ask you at this point, you wrote this book in 2019. If you had written it today, how different would this book have been? Well, if I'd had to write it today, I'd ask to wait a few months and to see how all this pans out. But for sure, at the very least, we'd have added a chapter to try and distinguish what we're writing about from the deaths that are happening now. But you gave a very good number there, which was this 150,000 of deaths of despair every year. Um, There's a normal level of that, which may be something like 60,000. So there's 90 to 100,000 deaths a year from these deaths of despair. That's higher than we think the number of people who are going to die from the COVID epidemic in the United States. And while we're pretty sure the COVID epidemic will go away, Um, barring, you know, reruns next year or the year after, um, these deaths of despair are going to go on and on and on. So we would not want to recall the book, as it were. We'd certainly want to add context about COVID, but I don't think the COVID has caused us to pull back on anything that's in the book. In fact, it strengthens the number of the arguments. Yeah, and in fact, you you have been speaking recently in the media, of course, also about this question that now we're in a recession. There is this debate about opening up the economy, and some people are saying, look, we have to open up the economy faster because, you know, we'll get more suicides in a recession like this. But I think you have a slightly different view on this and say, well, that may be true, but there's also a lot of uh, lives that are not being taken when we're moving into a recession. Is that correct? Yes, that's that's correct. And you summarized that as well as I could have done. Um, People find it very paradoxically because they always think about, you know, people jumping out of skyscrapers in the Great Recession or in the um, Great Depression, for example. But suicides are only 2% of all deaths um, today and then. And there are lots of other causes of death, and some of them get better um, during a recession. And the obvious ones are like road traffic accidents, um, construction accidents go down. Um, 
This time with social distancing, we're probably going to get a reduction in flu deaths too, because you know we'll be passing that around a lot less, and the same would be true of other infectious diseases. And it's also true that in recessions in the U.S., it's easier to get workers into care homes. Uh, many of them are paid near the minimum wage. And in boom times, it's very hard to get workers there in slumps or recessions. It's easier. And so they all tend to do better um, during recessions because they're better cared for. So when you add those up in a normal recession, it's not clear this is a normal recession, but a normal recession, that would save lives. Of course, it doesn't tell you that it's a good idea not to reopen the economy again. Um, we badly need that. But, um, you know, you don't want to... Um, use as an argument that the recession will be killing people. Right. It's a difficult balance between the lives that COVID-19 is taking versus the, the risks that you're running in terms of keeping the economy closed for too long. And, and your point basically is you should not overstate those risks. And nevertheless, the, the point, of course, is that, as you say, that we need to get things going one way or another. Yeah, so, absolutely. So let's let's go to the main subject matter uh, of the book to use that term and talk a little bit more detail about it. Um, if we talk about where deaths of despair occur, and uh, again, deaths of despair being related to a rise in suicides and drug and alcohol use, the group is very distinctive. Uh, it's distinctive by race, mainly focused on whites. It's distinctive by age. It's the 45 to 54 group in particular. It's distinctive by education because it's mainly people without a bachelor degree. And to some extent, it's distinctive by geography. It's widespread across the United States, but it's most strongly in states like West Virginia and Kentucky and Arkansas and Mississippi, which actually are states with the lowest education levels relative to the national average. And then other states like California, New York, and New Jersey and Illinois, it's significantly less. Yeah. Now, less education. Go ahead. Go ahead. I, I was just going to say that's correct, though it's not at all clear that it's much, once you've controlled for education, which, as you said, is driving a lot of this, that California and New Jersey and those places are that much worse than these other places. It's very, very widespread. And let me say one other thing about age. We first discovered it in midlife whites, but it's actually percolated down through the age distribution. So these deaths of despair are happening to everybody uh, aged above 25. And it happens that by birth, the later born people are getting it worse than the earlier born people. So we focused originally on the midlife people because those were the people whose total mortality was going up and the deaths of despair and the decline in mortality, well, the reversal of the decline in mortality from heart disease was driving that. But if you look at just deaths of despair, they're all the way down towards much younger people too. But what, I, what you said about um, people without BA is correct. That's the group that's affected. So, so let's zoom in a little bit more on this group. And, and how would you sort of characterize the state of affairs, the state of health for this group today? What, what makes them distinctly different from other groups? I mean, we, we sort of identified, of course, the, 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 the characterization, but there are other groups in American society that have gone or still go through horrendous times. In many instances, still are in difficult situations, notably, of course, African-Americans. So, so how does this specific group uh, you know, distinguish itself from these other groups? I'm very glad you asked that question because it's certainly true that these deaths of despair up until 2013 um, were rising exclusively, almost exclusively, in white non-Hispanics without a bachelor's degree. After 2013, this these deaths of despair began to show up in the African-American community, largely because of illegal fentanyl, which is about 100 times more powerful than heroin, um, finding its way into the inner city African-American communities. Um, but um, the big point that's really important to make is that what I've been talking about is increases. If you actually look at the levels, the mortality rates of African Americans are still higher than they are of whites. So through this period, the mortality rates of whites were rising and the mortality rates of African Americans were falling. But that historical difference of African Americans dying earlier and having higher mortality rates than whites 
um, is still there. It's better than it used to be, but African Americans do worse than whites. And part of the argument in the book is that the African American community experienced this disaster 40 or 50 years ago. So it's not like they're excluded. It's just they got it first. Interesting. So we need to take a deeper dive into sort of now some of the underlying root causes. But before we do that, let's take a quick break for a few announcements. Then we will continue this discussion with Angus Deaton on his latest book, Death of Despair. Can you, your team, or your company benefit from insights such as the ones provided in this podcast? They are immediately available when you join the conference board, a membership-based think tank that delivers trusted insights for what's ahead. Reaching across industries and geographies, we bring together our noted experts, senior executives from the world's largest companies, and nonpartisan practical research to help you address your most important business issues. Our membership packages are tailored to your organization's unique needs and budget. To learn more about our offerings, go to www.conferenceboard.org and click join on the top bar to connect with one of our product specialists. We're back with Angus Deaton, co-author of Deathless Despair and the Future of Capitalism. So Angus, let's take a, a little deeper look into the root causes of the deaths of despair. And maybe the best way to start is with the causes that you argue are less important. Uh, and let's start with inequality and poverty, which you would think about right away as being some of the main causes of the, of the problem we're looking at. You might. Um, but I mean, if, if you come into it as we did with the deaths of these white non-Hispanics, um, without a BA, you know, certainly some of them are poor, but they're not nearly as poor, not nearly as likely to be poor as African Americans are. So the poverty explanation doesn't really, it wasn't really much of a starter there. The issue about inequality, I've never understood why inequality is supposed to kill people. And the story we tell in the book is that the various forces, which I hope we're going to talk about um, that are destroying working class lives are those forces are both responsible for deaths of despair and for increasing inequality. So that we see inequality and deaths of despair as two of the outputs, the outcomes of these social processes that we identify. Right. But, you know, a lot of the inequality issues have been linked with these issues of globalization and technological change. You know, if you think about some of the work that, for example, David Ortur at MIT has done and said, you know, all this competition that we're getting from China has been hitting particular those states where we've seen uh, very high concentrations uh, of deaths of despair. And, and you know, that kind of uh, tr those kind of trends, of course, have caused a fair amount of inequality, no? Yeah, I agree. But that's exactly, you know, David's work is compra is not only comparable, it it's, um, supports ours and goes along with it. And we see globalization and technical change as huge forces. But the one thing you didn't say in that question was about um, people without a BA. So those are the people who have been most deeply affected by globalization and um, by automation. And it's not just in the places, but everywhere, those people have, are having a very, very hard time. They're also having a very hard time in Europe because of these issues, but maybe not quite as bad. Um, but we identify other forces that we think, you know, Globalization and automation are basically good things. Um, they have to be handled properly. Um, but we identify other forces, particularly the cost of the healthcare sector in the United States, that we see as adding to those and hollowing out. In our recent piece, we called it, or taking a wrecking ball um, to the labor market for less educated Americans. Right. So the root causes, let's then go to the causes that you do argue are very important. As you said, that's really what we want to talk about. So those are related to, if I understand it well, the declines in real wages and jobs, particular among those uh, people with uh, no BA degree. Uh, right. And you link that then in turn, you, you link that decline in wages and the decline in good jobs, particular to the failure of the US healthcare system, and then even more specifically to the very rapid, extraordinary rise in healthcare cost. So maybe that's you can right. take a little bit through that argument. Okay, but let me qualify first. So none of this denies the importance of globalization and automation, right? But 
we probably don't want to stop globalization and we don't want to stop automation because they're making us all better off. Yeah. But what we're doing is this third thing, which is also a cause, is this extraordinary cost of this predatory healthcare system. And that extraordinary cost is also taking a wrecking ball of the labor market and acting together with globalization and technical change to make life miserable for working class people. So that's the structure of the argument. And also healthcare is something we can do something about. It's a self-inflicted wound, whereas, you know, we want technical change. Um, we want the benefits of globalization. What we don't want is this outrageously expensive healthcare system. So I could talk a little bit about how we think that works. Um, part of it is just that it's enormously costly. And, you know, if we're spending 18% of GDP on healthcare compared with Switzerland, which is the next highest, which spends about 12%, then there's 6% of GDP that we're spending on healthcare that doesn't need to be spent on healthcare. And in fact, is giving us a much lower life expectancy than any other rich country. So we're wasting a terrific amount of money. And that amount of money, various people are calculating in various different ways. It's about a trillion dollars a year. Now, again, we're all got used to talking about billions and trillions as if, you know, what do they mean? But a trillion dollars a year is $8,000 per family um, in the United States. And the decline in wages that we've seen over the last 50 years for people without a bachelor's degree, that would not have happened if this hadn't been this huge increase in healthcare costs. Again, let me say a trillion dollars is 50%. That's the waste, not the total cost. The cost is about $4 trillion. The waste, the trillion dollars waste, is one and a half times what we spend on the military. So there's just this huge burden on society that is being imposed, it's like a huge tribute we have to pay every year. But instead of paying it to a foreign power, we're paying it to this bloated healthcare sector, which costs much too much. Now, part of the story is that a lot of people get their health insurance through their employers. And health, the cost of health insurance, which last year was um, $20,000 for a family policy or $10,000 for an individual policy, is basically insupportable um, for low-paid workers. So if you're, say, a CEO or you're the employment, the personnel director in a firm, and you've got some workers like a janitor or a doorman or something um, who's worth, say, twenty-five dollars or $30,000 a year to the firm. That's what the firm would pay for this person's services. If you have to pay $10,000 out of that or $20,000 out of that, it's just not going to happen. So what has progressively happened is American businesses has just shed those jobs. So very, very few American corporations anymore have their own janitors, have their own security guards, have their own self, um, you know, caller center people, um, their food service workers, their drivers. You know, a lot of these that were really good jobs um, for people without a BA. And you could go into a company and you might start in the mailroom or you might start as a doorman. But if you had the talent, you could work your way up and you might even finish up as CEO. There are lots of stories. Right. I, obviously, it didn't happen to everyone, but it was a real possibility. But if you're working for the all bright cleaning company, <laughs> you know, and all it does is clean. There's no way you're ever going to make a life or a career out of that. So it's not just the loss of jobs and the loss of salary and the loss of benefits. It's the loss of meaning in life. So if people, I, I certainly understand the argument that, you know, if people are in a job, uh, you know, even though the company can cover healthcare, you know, at the lower end of the wage range, that healthcare costs can still be a, a very big burden, uh, and particular uncertainty and all the co-pays and everything else can kick in. If people, if people lose their job, isn't Medicaid a program that is then going to step in? And why, why would it be hard for these people to access or use Medicaid? Well, um, I'll explain that in a minute, but let me start. It's also a burden on the firm yeah. because the firm would like to keep these workers if they could pay them a reasonable wage and didn't have this enormous burden. You know, there's a lot in the literature about what raising the minimum wage does to employment. This is much worse than that. Okay, so if, if they lose their job, and this brings us back to COVID because there's a huge number of people now who just lost their jobs 
Um, and there's basically three ways they can continue to get health insurance. One is if they're poor enough, they could qualify for Medicaid, but a lot of them won't. The second thing is there's COBRA, which is the scheme that allows you to keep your health insurance that you had before, provided you pay not only your share, but the share that the employer um, was paying. And the third thing is if you're fired, you qualify for, if you lose your job, that's an event that allows you to enroll in Obamacare. So there's three possibilities if you lose your job, but a lot of them are not going to be covered by any one of those. And the paperwork is a nightmare. Yeah, so it's it's in part also simply because it's just hard for people to actually get access to these programs, even though they're there. They're just not, they, they get no assistance in way of how they can use these programs optimally. Well, they might get some assistance, but it's going to be hard. And a lot of them won't qualify anyway. Right, right. Okay, there was is one other important cause in addition to the decline in real wages and the disappearance of good jobs and the healthcare cost increases. There's one other explanation. It goes back a little bit to the role of inequality, but it's a much more nuanced point that you're making because there's a specific aspect about inequality that you do actually think is, if I understand this correctly, is a major cause of the issues that we're facing, and that is the sort of upward redistribution of income. Uh, and maybe you can explain the term a little bit more and how you see that fitting into this uh, problem. Right. Well, it's, um, you know, the, um, again, it's, this is not a cause, you know, the upward redistribution of income is generating inequality and that's coming through these processes. So for instance, you know, if we all have to pay very high premium for our health care, then that money goes to people who are pretty well off by and large. I mean, think of the executives and pharma companies, um, hospitals, you know, which used to be run by doctors are now run by, they're still doctors, but they're managers and they make very large salaries. Um, they're device manufacturers who are extremely well paid. A lot of that stuff is very expensive. And so we're buying a lot of health care that we don't need. And that's generating income for some pretty high end people. You know, doctors are the largest single occupation in the top 1%. Um, and, you know, if we're taking money from workers and giving it to doctors, that's hurting workers and it's creating inequality. So we see these two things going along side by side at the same time yeah and that really gets now to the heart of the of the solutions i think and and you're very clear in the book i want to emphasize this that th this is not a book against free markets or against capitalism on the contrary you argue that actually free markets and capitalism is is a key to get out of this situation uh, you just argue that it needs to work better so what are at the conference board we use a term called sustaining capitalism which i think is comparable to what you're saying what, what are the key elements Okay. Of using capitalism in a better way. All right. Well, there's two parts to that. I mean, the one part is capitalism cannot deliver healthcare. You have to be a market fundamentalist. It just cannot do it. I mean, Kenneth Arrow, one of the greatest economists of the 20th century, wrote a famous paper in 1962 in which he explained that free markets cannot deliver healthcare in a socially acceptable way. I mean, you could get government completely out of it. Um, but then a lot of people would just die when they were sick. So you can't, it's just not going to work. And the truth is there's no people say, well, look at what happened in Britain. Look at what happens in Italy. There's no perfect healthcare system in the world, but you cannot do it through free markets. So the magic of free markets, the magic of competition, the magic of capitalism, which I really believe in, you know, you just, you're going to bring it into disrepute um, if you try to deliver the healthcare system that way. And what it does is because governments have to get involved, there's what we call rent seeking. You know, there are five healthcare lobbyists in Washington for every member of Congress. And they're just reaping benefits for themselves. And, you know, they're making themselves rich at the expense of everybody else, creating inequality and impoverishing um, everybody else. So that's a real problem. The rest of capitalism, and I like your phrase, sustainable capitalism, you know, you have to just root out the abuses. So an obvious possibility here is there's a lot of debate going on among economists and others right now and lawyers about antitrust. And there's a feeling that antitrust has antitrust enforcement has sort of dropped the ball 
and that maybe um, you know some of the catch and kill procedures, the mergers procedures, you know, have not been well enough scrutinized. And you know, in the last chapter of the book, we talk about you know capitalism in America more generally, and we're not condemning it in the way that we condemn the healthcare sector. It's just that you know it has to be brought under control. It has to be made sustainable so that it doesn't the abuses that can happen are not allowed to happen. And then on the other hand, we get these amazing benefits that it can deliver too. Yeah, I mean, in a way, I think what you're saying is you just have to address the rough edges of cap- of, of capitalism, and you can't be a blind believer in it. You have to show that it works, right? And, That's and, right. right. And we have to root out the rent seeking, the lobbying, the enormous amount of people buying personal favors that help them and hurt the rest of it. Yeah. So. Uh, many people on this uh, podcast by the conference board are business executives. So, so if you if you think about this story, what is the call to action for the business community in your view? Well, the first call to action for the business community is to get behind getting healthcare out of business, right? Getting rid of the employment healthcare system because it's a disaster, and it's making business worse off, and it's making. Um, you know, the workers worse off as well. I mean, it was Warren Buffett who called it a tapeworm at the heart of American business. And I think that's right. And, you know, you can prance and reject socialized medicine and all these sort of things, but any other system in the world is better than the one we have now. And it's bad for business as well as it's bad for workers. So that's the big message. Mm Mm-hmm. And what's your preference for a better healthcare system? Is it the NHS in the UK or are you looking at some of the European systems? that are? I think some of the European systems would probably work better in America. Um, but there's a lot of regulation there. Some of them have insurance companies, but the insurance companies are basically contractors for the state. Um, you don't have to have what Americans think of as socialized medicine in which the government employs all the doctors and nurses. But, you know, I come from Britain. The National Health Service has been a great success there. Sometimes it's described as the national religion. Um, You won't find many people in America who love their health service in the way that the Brits love theirs. So I'm not advocating that. I think there should be a big debate, but we've got to stop doing what we're doing now. So what I didn't see a lot about in your book was, and this is again to sort of a role of business, is sort of education and training. Now, education is, of course, something yeah. to schools, but I'm particularly thinking of business training and vocational training. If we're seeing these very rapid changes happening in the economy, how can business help to actually transition some of these people from the jobs that won't be there anymore to jobs that actually will come? And I, I don't think you talked a lot about it in the book, so I was wondering about your view on that. Yeah, we talk about about it. But um, I think, you know, we have this huge educational divide, obviously, these deaths of despair happening to people who don't have a BA. And the number of people getting BAs is not going up very much, in spite of the fact that the premium from the wage premium is now about 80%, whereas it used to be 40%. And, you know, I don't think you want to get everybody to have a BA. And, you know, we're very attracted by things more like the German system. Um, whereby, and I think, you know, there ha- have been some pilot schemes and I think businesses cooperating with um, junior colleges and with regular universities, right. um, would, if we could get much more of that going, that would be a really good thing. So why and, can we not do that? Because it has that's not a been really good question, with capitalism <laughs> or the fate of capitalism. So why is that so hard in the U.S.? I don't know. I really don't know. Uh, because the, what we have right now is not good because, you know, from kindergarten on, we're trying to get people into college, but only a third of the people go to college. So what about the other two thirds? And, you know, businessmen complain all the time that people coming out of university or people coming out of high school are not trained the way they want them. So they can certainly play a role in developing more of these schemes um, which address that. But there's got to be a way of retraining. Right. So as I understand it in Germany, um, you, you do an apprenticeship for some useful task. And when that task goes away, your employer accepts the responsibility of retraining you to do something else. So that's a very important part of it, too.
Yeah, and I think I, to me, to me, I think one part, of course, is if you want to ask people to deal with structural change, as we call it, and retrain and reskill themselves, there's got to be a reward, and it, it, there has to be an incentive for them to do that. One incentive is that you're not going to lose your job, and maybe that is something that is very difficult for businesses to actually say, "Yeah, we retrain you, but we still can't tell you whether you're going to keep a job because of that." That's right. That seems to be the case. And also the safety net in general is much more fragmentary here than in most of Europe. Yeah. So yeah. losing your job is a much worse thing, especially if you lose your health care. I'm yeah. sorry to keep harping about health care, but no, I really I... do think it's a cancer in our society. Yeah, no, and, you've, and you've been very clear about that. And I think that is a very, very good and detailed analysis in the book. Now, as I mentioned at the start of the podcast, I, I want to wrap up with placing the death of despair back in today's context uh, of the COVID crisis. At the end of the introduction to the book, and you wrote this probably before this pandemic happened, yes. you said this, you say, you know, history has shown us that large institutional changes, as you just argued for, can happen peacefully without war or pandemic. Now the pandemic is there. Uh, and how will that impact the change in capitalist institutions? W will the pandemic help or will it make it even more difficult to make these changes that you are? I put, I'd about, put about 50-50 on either of those outcomes, which I know is not very helpful. Um, you know, you could have a collapse. And, you know, in some countries, that collapse, you know, in the 30s or after the progressive era produced great steps forward. But it could also produce Hitler. You know, so there's... Bad outcomes as well as really good ones. Um, I do think there's a fair chance, as we argued in our recent piece in the New York Times, that um, the healthcare system will get changed because of this, mm. uh, depending on what happens. Um, but I also think something I hope for very much is that I think we've overvalorized the market relative to things that we have to do collectively. And, you know, a pandemic is the absolute, um, you know, highest test you could impose on a system that doesn't value public action very much because we have to act as a community to defeat something like a pandemic. And there are lots of other things like bioterrorism or even more severe viruses or, you know, in a wartime attack from abroad where we have to act collectively. And I think We've gone a little bit too far, more in America than elsewhere, but elsewhere too, on thinking that the market can solve all problems and that we don't need collective effort, the state or whatever you like it. So I think we're going to have to rebalance um, our respect for the state um, relative to our respect for the undoubted virtues of the market. Yeah. Another famous economist that you quote in the book is, of course, Joseph Schumpeter. And Schumpeter is talking about creative destruction. And of course, it raises the question at this point, will we create more? Will we become more innovative with some people are hoping for that digital transformation may finally open things up? Or is this an era in which destruction could be become a bigger problem and actually move us into a period of even slower growth than what we've been seeing before in the past decade? That's that's very hard to tell. I think we'll get slower growth. Um, and I think, you know, one analysis of the way we've been living is that we've been having too much risk in our portfolio in exchange for higher returns. So that globalization brings us higher levels of GDP. There's no doubt about that. But it also brings risks with it, like you know, you can't get toilet paper in a pandemic because for reasons I don't fully understand, some part of toilet paper comes from China. Um, some enormous proportion of our essential medicines are made in India and China. And that is really living dangerously. And, you know, maybe we can get them cheaper from there. We get better benefits. We get higher GDP, all those sort of things. But we put ourselves at risk. And I think that's going to have to be rethought. So I get my guess is that globalization will be slowed and maybe even reversed a bit. So we may actually get some reshoring of jobs, um, which is something I thought I'd never say. But um <laughs> I think we might, and I think that would be good for income inequality too, because a lot of these reshore jobs would help boost the wages of less educated Americans. 
I can see the sequel to your book coming. So uh, <laughs> um, we, we need to wrap it up here. Uh, Angus, I want to congratulate congratulate you and your co-author, NKs, with bringing such an important topic to the attention of a, a very wide audience. This is a very easy to read, complex, uh, a complex topic, but easy to read book. Um, thank you for, for joining us today. And thank you very much. Can I say one thing to your listeners about buying the book? Yeah, sure Amazon you can. Amazon is still quoting about almost a month delay, but lots of independent bookstores, even though they're closed, are delivering much more quickly than that. So this might be a good time to support your local bookstore. Deaths that's, of Despair and the Future of Capitalism. Thank you. That's, that's a great ad. Absolutely. Thank you. This ends this edition of Off the Shelf. If you are interested in similar content or other podcast programs from the conference board, please go to your favorite podcast channel, subscribe, so you will get notified of upcoming programs and shows. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Bart van Aardek, Chief Economist at the Conference Board.